what were the first big breaks after that that came in your career that felt a little more like momentum as you came up? Uh, well, uh, the biggest one was, again, I'm in Poughkeepsie. I decide I'm going to give it five years. And back then, there was no sports talk radio. All there was was the WFUV Fordham radio station had this talk show for 40 years. And Art Russ Jr. had a show on uh, WABC Radio in New York. There was no WFAN. There was no sports talk. And NBC Radio decided to have a nighttime sports talk. They had Imus was in the morning, Soupy Sales midday, Howard Stern in the afternoon, <laughs> and they're going to have soupy sports sales. talk. <laughs> soupy Sales in the midday. Holy how shit. About, how about that, that so lineup? <laughs> 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 okay, so this is the advent. If it's pre-sports radio, we're talking about, uh, what are we talking about here? Late 60s, early 70s, Soupy Sales. No, this soupy is, Sales is like a name from... Uh, this, is, this is 85, 86. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, but Soupy Sales is from a different time. Right, this was, pa this was past his TV time, he, but he was doing the radio there. And uh, so they had a, a sports talk show that I heard about, and I'm thinking maybe I could get in there. And I found out the producer was a young man named Chris Doyle, who I went to college with but had lost contact with. I'm thinking, it can't be the same Chris Doyle. So I called him, and I said, uh, listen, I, any, any job openings? He goes, no, not right now, but if something comes up, I'll let you know. So I continued the job in Poughkeepsie, which was six days a week. And he called me after a few weeks and said, we need a producer on Saturday nights. So that was I started working at WNBC Radio in New York the one day a week ahead off from Poughkeepsie, and then it became two days, then it became three days. So that was the biggest break. And again, it, it's just somebody I went to college with. Every job I've ever received was through somebody that I knew, that I had a relationship with. And that's, that was the, the, the theme throughout the whole damn thing. How soon after that were you doing actual play-by-play? -play? Because you've got to, that requires a great deal of training, it requires a great deal of practice, sculpting to get good at. You can't just be put at a microphone and do it well. Right. Well, it, well, it, it was I did mostly producing work, but then I, I went to the program director and I said, hey, listen, I'd like to do reports from Jay Stadium, Yankee Stadium, Madison Square Garden. And he said, okay, we'll send you out there. So the sports talk show host was a guy named Jack Spector, and Jack would have me go out and cover it. So it became half producing, half announcing. Then it became more announcing than producing. It was just a, a slow process, and then they – the big break was when they did a simulcast on the MSG network. And the producer on the simulcast was Mike McCarthy. I was the producer on the radio cast. So we became great friends. And he got put up uh, higher in the pecking order at, at the Garden. And when a radio job came open for the Knicks uh, to do the play-by-play, -play, he went to their bosses and, and said, I got a young guy that, that's going to, we think, is really good. And that changed everything. When did you realize you were good at it? Uh... I, I thought I was pretty good at the radio. Um, you know, when you grow up in New York and you listen to Marv Albert, both radio and TV, um, something, if that's what you want, something stirs in you. I mean, there's nobody better. No one's ever called basketball better. So, you know, I modeled myself after him but not like him. And I thought after, after the first year, I'm like, okay, I, I'm pretty good at this. If you told me I was going to be the, the radio voice of the Knicks for the next 30, 40 years, I'd be the happiest person in the world. And I would have been. The dream looked like what back then, though? Was it to be Marv Albert? Something like Marv Albert? Um, I thought I achieved the dream when I got the Nick radio job. And I remember Marv was still doing TV for the MSG Network then, and he called me after I got hired, called my house. And I remember getting off the phone saying to my wife, Marv Albert just called me to congratulate me. Welcome to the team. It's like... It doesn't, that dream doesn't get any better than that. So again, that's what kind of, I never imagined doing full-time television. I thought radio was going to be my gig. That's what I always did. And that would have been fine. How old were you when Marv Albert called your house to tell you you've arrived at your dreams? Um, I'm going to say 28. Okay. So that call on the landmarks of moving moments that you've had where you remember the lighthouses of emotion, like, oh, my God, I'm so happy that I'm here. I know that you probably feel a degree of that daily just because of the energy of being around what you get to be around. But at the beginning, what are the landmarks? 
Say that again. The, the times that you're most emotional because you're sitting in a seat, because right. you've arrived at, at what you know is your dreams, far removed from whatever that application for steel fitting looked like. Right. Um, you know, it's kind of when you, when you see the person again now, it, it makes, like, y you see this person and you think, wow, um, back then, how they helped me, how they cha helped change my life. Uh, that's when I get the most emotional, when you get a chance to see. Um, for example, uh, Pat Riley, when I was a Nick radio announcer, I used to do this <coughs> pregame uh, recording with him. And you'd go into his office, and he had dark lights, and you'd go in and ask a few questions, and then you'd leave. There was no social banter. But I learned so much from those interviews and saw his intensity, et cetera. So after the first year, he gets... Um, I get, I, I didn't think he knew my name, but a week after the first year, I get a handwritten letter from Pat Riley thanking me for the professional job I did that year, and I thought that was just the greatest thing. Then he has his four years of great success in New York and leaves to come to Miami, and after the announcement, I got another letter from him thanking me for four years of being part of a great journey. It, the letter meant so much to me that at a time when he was going through all this, he took the time to handwrite a letter to me. So I lost those letters in the fire. But my wife, and she didn't tell me right away, there were certain things when the people go in to try and salvage stuff, they found a few things. One of them was that letter. She had it sent to be restored and cleaned and stuff, and she just sent it to me the other day. And I get the letter and I look at it, and I, I just got so emotional because of that letter. And I brought it to Pat before game one of the finals. And I showed it to him. And uh, he got emotional as well. And it, that's, that's when those things come up. And, and when you see the person who made a difference, because that letter gave me confidence that Pat Riley thought I was, I was good at my job. When you're an, an NBA play-by-play -play guy and Pat Riley thinks you're good, um, it, it gives a young man confidence. And that's what came through, and that's why I got so emotional. He appreciates both professionalism and craftsmanship. He probably saw very early on that you were made of a certain thing uh, that he, he respected and respects the fact that you take care in the work that you do. Right, and it, it makes a difference. It makes you, f it, it, again, it just it makes you feel, okay, I can do this. What else was found or recovered? Um, the other thing that she didn't tell me about right away is I'm not a big memorabilia guy. I've never really asked for autographs. But one year the NBA had this uh, situation where they, they let players put their nicknames on the back of their jersey. It was, they did it for one week. That was a cool idea. So ESPN, when we were doing our games, they gave us jerseys. Um, Jeff Van Gundy had the notorious JBG. Mine was the Gray Mamba because of, obviously, my hair. So I'm thinking, you know what? I'm gonna get I'm gonna get Kobe to sign that, and he signed the jersey from one Mamba to another, and it was great. And and I got to know him pretty well at the end of his career, and then even after his career, more so. I did a couple of speaking engagements with him, so that one really meant something to me. And I was that's one of the first things I thought of when about oh, would we lose? And um, my wife found that they found that, and that's being restored as we speak.